Hey everybody, Jeff Manchester here. Welcome to another sort of deconstruction breakdown of a queue. Uh, this is a bit different though because I have a new toy to play with. Uh, a company whom I respect tremendously, Sonokinetic, reached out and they were like, do you want to play and check out something that we're working on, give us some feedback, and they didn't have to ask me twice. It's called Ostinato Strings. Boom, there she is. Now before I explain what it is and how I used it uh, and how I did the rest of the stuff in the queue, it's important, I think, to just think about what an ostinato is and define what it is. It's not a term designed to terrify non-musical people. It's quite simple, actually. It's just a repeating, looping pattern of notes. And typically, if you're playing on the piano, it'll happen with the right hand and the treble and the upper registers, and something else will happen with the left hand. And let me show you what I mean. So, for example, here's one of my favorite ostinatos from Radiohead Letdown. I uh, didn't play that quite properly, but anyway, that comes in, and then we have something happening with the left hand. One of my least favorite, but maybe the most popular ostinato of all time, comes from uh, a little band called Coldplay, Clocks. Anyway, let's not do too much Coldplay today, okay? Now that you know what an ostinato is, I think it's time to hear the cue, and it's time to hear ostinato strings in action. I'll spend the first chunk of the video describing what it is and how I used it, and then I'll spend the next chunk going through all the other stuff. So without further ado, here's a little cue. Here we go. Okay, anyway, little demo. Well, it's not a demo. <laughs> it's not a demo, it's a cue. And if I go to this track here, I just have like a little ostinato test track so I can show you some of the stuff uh, that this thing can do. I know it looks a little complicated, it's not. But one of the cool things, you can kind of rabbit hole or you can just keep it simple. The first thing I want to point out is just maybe the most complex, but easy to use. It's the harmonic shift section. People who have played with Sonic Connects libraries in the past will be familiar with the harmonic shift. This is a totally reinvented harmonic shift. Think of this as like a, a one finger chord player. It's a voice leading player. So for example, I'm gonna pick C just to keep it simple. And now we can have automatic voice leading. And so we can go with relative mode or absolute mode. So this plays the relative of C. In this case, we're in C. So if I play with my right hand, go up the scale. Anyway, um, one of the cool things is that I don't have to keep my hand down on the left side. For example, if I play a C minor really quickly, watch the left here. Now, harmonic shift will remember that that was the chord that was played, and I can just dance around with my right hand. 
Now, this might sound inelegant, but that's only because we're just mucking around, right? And that's something else I want to point out is that it's really important to release the notes at the right time for the best result. I think that's sort of consistent with a lot of other sample libraries, not just from Sonal Kinetic. It takes some practice to really get the most out of it. So again, absolute or relative. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'm sure Sonal Kinetic will have far more competent people explaining how this works on their website. So please go there for like a proper ostinato strings tutorial. The next thing I want to point out is just that we have different rhythms that we can construct. You'll notice that, for example, in the bass, which I'll play right here, uh, let me solo this and let me bring it up. Watch how the notes dance around and we get different rhythms. get the picture right so if we go back to the test ostinato test ostinato it sounds like Italian for testosterone or something um, I can play a chord Oop, I have that soloed there we go so we can really jump around and dance around and we can also change what we're hearing so I can exclude all the low-end information even some of the stuff in the middle and just get those high notes You'll see now they're grayed out if I ungray them. Uh, we can do this with key switching, by the way, but just, I got a mouse, I got a hand, let's do, let's do it this way. If I press those chords again. So that's how I was doing it down in the uh, bass, um, bass part. That's how I was affecting those things. So um, we can also, do this which means that they're not going to follow each other so we can control them independently so right now if I turn the bass back on turn everything back on if we look here this is where I'm gonna play I'm gonna play a C just to keep it simple but down here with my right hand I'm gonna I'm gonna play with this area here now look at the orange on the bottom Do the same just with the top so now they're sort of independent of each other I prefer harmony personally so I'm gonna put them back together but you can come up with little cool patterns just to add vitality and life to what you're doing in that way ostinato strings is kind of like not static like um, some of the other ones especially from native instruments the other thing I want to bring your attention to, especially for sonokinetic users, is that now we really have more chord types that we can play, and I play them all over this demo, but C major, or not major, but the C, now we can do minor, you do dominant 7, minor 7, go all over we can do susses as well for those sus fans out there sus four anyway I just think that's really cool um, we can invert the bass offer on which I didn't really mention oh if you click on this little thing we get like the volume and panning and mic positions again this is maybe more for your sonokinetic official tutorial go there and check that out um, one last thing I want to point out, at least from the sonokinetic uh, side, is the use of inversions. And people who have done a little bit of music theory knows, know what those are. So if I bring up this section here and solo it, you'll see that I use some inversions. Basically, if I play a C again, inverting the chord means I'm not changing the chord. I'm just maybe saying, you know what, I want the G to be played maybe at C in the C5 range so like a couple octaves up and I want the C to be played a few octaves down it just changes the tone of the chord and we can do that with a couple of uh, key switches so let me play this I'm gonna solo it and you can have a look at some of the numbers that are dancing around one two three and four and five and you can hear how it inverts the chord and changes the tone and sometimes adds a couple of notes but all to complement the chord structure So every time I change chords, which you can see right here, these are the names of the chords, I change the voicing. So if I, for example, if I go back to my to my ostinato test up here, again, if I play my C, let me bring it back down so it's less chaotic. 
Just by moving this around, I've added an extra note. I've changed the voicing. Two, and then one. So it's the same chord, but we're just changing the tone by moving around and playing with the notes. And with five, we get extended chords. So this adds tensions to the chords. If I don't want to do inversions that way, we can do quick one-off inversions, which is kind of cool. See these notes down here? If I press them, they're going to be armed red. And what this means is I'm going to get a quick one-off inversion. I'm going to arm this by hitting um, D. So there, there's D. And now if I play it, it turns back to normal. Let's try it again. I'll hit E. Play a C minor instead. Play that same C minor turn back to normal. So quick one-off inversions. Anyway, more information, go to Sonic Connect's website, but that's just a quick and dirty sort of ostinato strings introduction. Let's get into the rest of the track. So um, that's pretty much all the ostinato stuff. And we have some woodwinds, which come, surprise, surprise, from Sonic Kinetic. I'm going to unmute that and have a listen to this. So this just opens things up, these uh, woodwinds. And I made the decision, this comes from uh, Sato, by the way, and that's again, there it is, very pretty, right there. And basically I did some volume automation to make sure that this little accent disappears so that it doesn't interfere with all the other stuff. Because you can see, you can hear it kind of coming back up, so I, I just made the decision to, to, to kill that. It's also low in the mix, pretty much, and it's panned slightly a hair to like one o'clock. Um, I have a run coming up here. Um, and this is from Spitfire, I believe. Yeah, I think I got this from Albion 1. So basically, we're just introducing the biggest part of the track, which is like the chorus, I guess. I don't know. And it sounds like this. So if I play this, you know, we can move up and down. Um, you know, so it ascends basically one octave and it's chromatic, so yeah, that's what it sounds like. Hear it in context. Now, I wanna get to my pianos because I love these pianos. I picked this up from Native Instruments on uh, Cyber, you know, the Cyber Cell, they had everything half off. This is, I've been after this for a while. People on the channel know that I love Niels Fromm. And uh, anyway, this is a piano that he sort of, he and another guy supervised the construction of this piano, it's one that Niels uses, and um, just lovely sounding. So if we solo these these guys here. Again, some volume automation, just to introduce them. And we can hear the felt hitting the hammers. We can even hear the chair creaking, which I love. And they're just playing little arpeggios. If I unsolo them, put them back. So I made the executive decision just to pan this a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the right. And this is, uh, this main one's a little louder than everybody else. And that's kind of, that was my intention. So it's, it just, it sort of takes the lead and it introduces the track. I love the physicality of this instrument, and I really love the fact that in ostinato strings, if you listen carefully, you can actually hear the players, I mean, moving back when they're finished playing. Uh, for example, have a listen here and see if you can really zero in and hear, um, I think the player or the players just withdrawing their bows from the strings or their violins and violas and the cellos and stuff. It's so cool, and I really, I'm really happy they're doing it, and I, I want other companies to do this too, to introduce physicality into uh, into their sample. So have a listen here. Uh, it might be a little jarring because it's it's distorted and everything. Do I have anything else soloed? No. Did you hear that? 
It's almost like you can hear the chairs creaking and stuff, which I love. I, I'm happy they didn't RX it out. I'm going to play it one more time just because I'm obsessed. Hear that? You can almost hear someone breathing. I love that. Thank you for including that sound on Kinetic. It's wonderful. And it must have been a real challenge for them to get every single passage automated, not automated, but like loudness normalized so that when you're switching between those um, those different rhythms and stuff, they all sound consistent. So that must have been a fun challenge for them. Um, anyway, let's move on. I have some woodwinds here. This track is very heavy. Uh, we're in the reeds. It's a dumb joke. Um, and if I back it up here, I'm using um, Evo... Uh, from Spitfire again I'm using Evo 4 which is woods and we just have them sort of percolating and in, again introducing the track in a sort of earthy dynamic kind of spooky way have a listen So again, it's just sort of like welcome to the queue, right? Like welcome to the project. I'm just holding down a couple of keys in this case. I think I have, yeah, like a C minor. So C, E flat, and G. And then I do some voicing stuff. I'm inverting it, right? I have a G introduced down here, but I'm still playing it up here. So, so I'm messing with the voicing, just like I was showing you before. Now I have an even lower G. Things are kind of rattling a little bit. And now we get C, so we're doing some more inversions. It's all about inversions. So they're trilling a little bit, right? Now, to introduce the passage here, which is kind of like, you know, like before the storm breaks and the clouds part and blah, blah, blah. It's just this section here at bar 21. So have a listen to it. It's sort of... We take a second and we kind of dive into the ostinato string. So have a listen. I use some woodwinds here. Okay, so to add tension and to really make that moment stand out but not take away from everything else that's going on, I have another instance of uh, Evo 4 woodwinds, but I've chosen a different patch. I think I have anyway. If I cancel that, I think I clicked the wrong one. There, trilling reeds. So we've sort of mashed up the pegs a bit, and we're playing with sort of a scarier, more tension-filled cue. Let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. And I've also got some volume automation. Yeah. So it just sort of brings a bit of suspense. Um, now I have a violin as well, and I love this violin. Um, and I, you'll notice, by the way, that I don't, I don't have a lot of effects on these tracks, right? Like companies like Sonokinetic, Spitfire, and all the rest of it, they have their own analog. I'm assuming, I don't know about Sonokinetic, but, you know, Spitfire, they're quite proud to sort of say how, you know, they're using ribbon mics that went into uh, a Neve and then the Neve out into, a, you know, an A to D converter designed by God himself. And, you know, so it, these things have really beautiful signal paths and really beautiful processing behind them. Why, why add compression? Why add, you know, if you're going to do EQ, do some maybe subtractive EQing, you know, if you're going to do any at all. Um, so I'm very light on the processing, and I hope that that gives you guys an indication of what gives this cue the sound it has. If you're compressing everything, you're limiting every track, every bus, that's only going to take away from the individual elements of the mix. They're not going to pop out as much because everything is getting squished into the same picture frame, so to speak. So save your compression, save your multiband compression if you're going to use any at all for mastering. You know what I mean? Don't don't hurt the track. Don't hurt the track by squishing the snot out of everything. Um, I just I'm saying that because I have a, an instance of the the Clarifonic, which I reviewed on the channel. You can go check that out. I'll leave a link to it. Um, and this is just you know the violin at this point. There's more instruments being added. It's kind of getting it's getting taken over. It's getting ganged up on by all the other instruments. So I want to make it poke a little bit. 
Um, so I've, you know, I've increased the focus at this point, you know, we're, we're doing some stereo stuff. So if I shift this here, the other one shifts on the, on the right side, I'm pointing at the screen like an idiot. You can't see my fingers, the clarity, you know, so this just gives it a bit of shimmer. If I bypass it, let's have a listen to it, um, on and then off. So here's the violin. If I bypass it, it's just a little, it's a little dull unbypass it and by the way this comes from uh, Veer Harmonics uh, Bohemian Violin so beautiful violin I've talked about it on the uh, on the channel before at least on Twitter so where the uh, Kush Clarifonic really steps in is here once everything comes in I bring the um, the violin uh, back again and it's kind of getting crowded by a lot of the other instruments. Let's go back a little bit and I'll A, B the Kush Clarifonics. You can hear how it's helping the violin poke through. So it just helps it poke through and it's it's like, hey, guys, I'm still here. Like, you know, don't shout over me. So that's what that's all that's doing. I could have used an EQ, but instead I really like uh, the Clarifonic. So I wanted to, um, to have the opportunity to use it. Uh, the brass, this is, I mean, we're just getting some swells, some brass swells from the brass ensemble. This is the symphony series, part of Native Instruments. And again, we just have these, right, these swells that go on and on and they're just to introduce some low-end information into the beginning and I'd add a different instrument I mean at this point it's all piano and reed so I'm like well let's get some brass in there too so you can see the progress here and again I'm just doing an octave apart right so there's the C's and I think we have some more coming up here So those are E-flats. Those are again some Cs. And in the mix... Okay, so for the drums, I mean... Keep it simple, right? For the drums, all I have are Action Strikes, Tycho Invasion, one of my favorite packs. Uh, people sleep on this because I guess it's a bit of a legacy product now, but it is so good. And I just I have it doing the same freaking thing over and over and over. Um, and I've also added a bit of accent with some of the toms and stuff like that. Like I, I, I'll, I'll hit, I'll slam my fingers down just so we get a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a wake up call with the drums. What I mean by that, let me show you. So watch the MIDI here. Here. So that's me just playing the existing keys that I have in that section, and I got my fingers down on the C's, which are actually, you know, that's what triggers the chord, uh, not the chord, but the sequence to loop. And then I can hit, if I press this here, hear that? If I bring this up, it might be actually a bit more instructive to you guys. So. Anyway, so that's all, I'm, that's literally all I'm doing. My focus is really on orchestrating and doing some of the instrumentation for the upper stuff, not the bottom stuff like drums. I like to just let the drums loop and for cues like this anyway. Um, we have rise and hit, and I've got a little bit of reverb um, from Logic on the rise and hit. And again, this is Native Instruments, and this is just to sort of bring about the end of days here with this cue. It's just to sort of accent and say we're done, the cue is almost over, things are swelling and they're sort of draining into a big sink. Metaphors, right? Let's do that again.
Isn't that fun? That's all that is. So that just, you know, it just accents things a little bit. And then finally we have these, I just call them, I call them slaps. It's a, it's a technical musical term uh, from the Oxford School of Music. No. Um, what is it? We just have people like just smacking their violins and violas. Call Legno. I don't know. I can't pronounce that. I'm not going to try. If I solo it, we can hear it, Jeff. So this is just accenting some of the drums that we have with some, you know, a bit of bit of attack from Albion One. So we have this. Here we go. And I'm playing these flats here because the whole key of the track I think is pretty much C minor. So I want to stay consistent with the key, right? And they have one at the one at the very end. And let's have a listen to it, maybe unsoloed. So it comes into the very end there. Um, so that's that's pretty much the whole cue. Again, if we go down my tracks, there is nothing happening here as far as compression or EQ goes. Um, trash again right to just add some distortion to the low end of those strings but i'm very conservative with my eqing and all that stuff people think that just because your daws have all this compression and limiting and delay and all that they have to be used they don't they don't have to be used because those samples were beautifully expertly recorded and they often don't need very much than maybe like a plate reverb or i don't even have any sends happening here all the stuff is happening within the instruments that i'm using so um there you go, a little breakdown of the cue. Plus, you guys got to meet Ostinato Strings from Sonokinetic. Again, head to the description to see, uh, well, to keep track of the production and when it's coming out. Hope you enjoyed that. Take it easy.